you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator and vice chancellor of the Taishulari University of Education, Professor Uluye Misi Obilade. Thank you very much. Uh, the Thank deputy you, president of the Senate, distinguished Senator Ovie Omoagege. Her Excellency, the First Lady of Ekiti State, Dr. B.C. Adelaide Fayemi. Our host, the Vice Chancellor of Bafemi Awolo University, Professor Eyitokwe Ogunbuero Ogunbodede. The former MA of Kano, His Royal Highness Dr. Muhammad Sanusi II. Director Ford Foundation, Mr. Innocent Chukuma. The guest speaker and chairman of the editorial board of these day newspapers, Mr. Olushegu Adini. Distinguished panelists, honored guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. I, I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to the Obafemi Awolo University for providing the platform for this very important conversation on finding safe spaces for female students in Nigerian universities. And also, uh, I uh, certainly am very grateful for the kind invitation uh, to me to make a few remarks at this webinar. I'm also grateful to my brother, Sheikh Mwadini, who insisted also on my participation at this webinar. His book, uh, Naked Abuse, uh, Sex for Grades in African Universities, uh, a research work sponsored by the Ford Foundation is, as the Vice Chancellor has pointed out, one of the main inspirations for this uh, webinar. I must confess that because of uh, the extremely readable style, and I hope that as many of us as possible have read it, uh, because of the extremely readable style that he adopts, I was almost grateful uh, that this research was not done by an academic like myself. I, with all apologies to my fellow professors. We would have ended up with volumes and volumes of uh, very difficult to read material, uh, very difficult to figure out. But I think Shegmo has, in a few pages, uh, done an excellent job of not just confronting us with the key issues in this sordid, um, uh, this sordid situations of sex for grades on the African continent, but he's also uh, made several uh, important suggestions on what to do. And, and how to solve uh, the problem. Um, let me begin by saying that for me uh, as an academic, uh, for me as an academic, uh, I am always mindful of the need, I think, to begin, and also as a lawyer, I'm also mindful of the need to define as well as possible what uh, the problem is. And I think uh, that is where I would just like to start, uh, by understanding the definition uh, of the words that we use and, of course, uh, the definition of this particular problem. It was the Association of Women Judges uh, who very recently, uh, in, a, uh, in a toolkit, which uh, they published quite, uh, quite recently, described this problem as sextortion. They, 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 they described it as ex sextortion. I think that, that that's an, an important, uh, I think it's an important definition because um, it, it, it is a definition that I think clearly puts in perspective what, our, what we should be thinking about and what the elements of, of this uh, are. are, are, are. Uh, the the definition as they as as they described it is the abuse of power to obtain a sexual favor or advantage. The abuse of power to obtain a sexual favor or advantage, or to borrow further from them, uh, they say that in effect, extortion is a form of corruption in which sex rather than money is the currency of the bribe a form of corruption in which sex rather than money is a currency of the bribe. And I think the definition is helpful because it, it also helps us to shape the uh, legal theory under which the conduct itself uh, can be dealt with. 
Evidently, under Nigerian law, uh, and uh, and I think uh, the right honourable uh, the deputy, the distinguished uh, deputy senate president, has already uh, covered uh, a fair amount of uh, the description of this offence under Nigerian law. But I think the offence could fit into well-established categories. It, of course, can qualify as an act of corruption. And as Shegun points out uh, in his book, the successful prosecution of uh, the professor, uh, Professor Akindele, I think it was, was done by the ICPC. That, uh, and the ICPC, of course, as you know, uh, bases uh, its prosecutions on definitions of corruption in the act. So what, what was needed to be proved and what you need to prove in, in, in such a case is that a person in a position of authority demanded gratification. And now this is a wide enough definition to cover a demand for sex in exchange for a benefit. In this case, good grades. So, so by definition, it is an act of corruption and it could qualify easily uh, uh, as, as, an act, uh, as an act of corruption. It could also qualify, as has been pointed out, as rape or attempted rape. The definition of rape under our law is having sex with a woman without her consent or where the consent was obtained by threats or by intimidation of any kind. Intimidation of any kind. And I think that's very important here because uh, a demand for sex with a choice of failure or success in an examination will, will qualify, uh, in my view, as threat or intimidation. By the way, punishment for rape uh, is life imprisonment, while attempted rape is 14 years imprisonment. So, the, so, so even the punishment is very severe. And a more all-encompassing definition, a more all-encompassing definition of rape and other forms of violence is contained in the Violence Against uh, Persons uh, Act, which um, uh, was referred to again by uh, the distinguished Senate President. Various iterations of that uh, law is now in place in several, domesticated in several of our states. So several states have various iterations of that law. Uh, but, I, I, but I agree with the uh, Deputy Senate President that there is still a need for a sexual harassment specific bill uh, because there are still uh, various contours of uh, sexual harassment that are not covered by the established definitions of uh, corruption, for example, or rape uh, under our laws in the South or under the penal code in the North. So I think a, 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 a sexual harassment specific legislation is still one that, that, that is desirable. I believe our search for answers to creating safe spaces uh, for female students in, in our universities must begin also from the question uh, of why is it that an evidently rampant wrongdoing is so underreported? Why is it that something that is so evidently rampant, and, and I don't think there is any need to belabor the point, it is clearly uh, rampant and, you know, uh, there are so many, uh, there, there, there are obviously so many uh, reports and so many cases of people who uh, would share their anecdotal experiences without necessarily reporting to the authorities. I think the answer is clearly uh, that this low reportability uh, is on account of the fact that many do not feel confident, victims do not feel confident that they will get redress, or that they, or that they will be treated fairly, or that they will not be visited with the same uh, fearful consequences that uh, was the subject of the demand uh, in the first place. They, 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 they fear that they will neither get a sympathetic nor understanding hearing, let alone justice, and that they will end up suffering the same consequences that the predator had threatened would occur if they did not submit, submit to their demands. Then there's, of course, the shame and stigma that could attend uh, speaking of. So I think uh, in, in, ensuring, uh, in ensuring that we, we create uh, safe spaces, we must, be, we must do at least the basics. 
which is providing the support and resources needed to report abusers. Every institution must make it easy for victims or potential victims to report perpetrators to trusted formal structures or secure channels created specifically for the purpose of, of, of resolving such cases. And I think it should be made very clear. Everyone, everyone ought, every institution ought to say, we have this structure. It is called XYZ and it's accessible to everyone, to every student. A well thought out whistleblower process emphasizing confidentiality and professional legal and medical help for victims or potential victims should be mandatory. I think that aside from abusers, aside from, sorry, aside from victims, whistleblowers, persons who have information, should also, under you know, a, a properly designed whistleblower scheme, be able to advance information that they have, give information that they have, and in appropriate cases, uh, professional legal and uh, medical help for victims should also be provided. To ensure that both faculty and students are sufficiently clear about the issues and the rules, because I think it's important for faculty to be very clear about what the rules are, and for students also to be clear about what the rules are. There's a need to devise codes of conduct or ethical guidelines based on best practices in appropriate student in, uh, lecturer interactions. It's important that these are clearly defined ethical guidelines that are contained in, 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 you know, in some document that people can refer to and people can see. And I think it's important both for the lecturer and for the, for the student that there is some reference to some kind of a code of conduct. Uh, and and uh, uh, Shegun in his book notes the practice, I believe is in Makerere University, where uh, as, a math, uh, as an ethical guideline, it is, it is required that consultations between students and lecturers must be done with doors open, uh, literally doors open. In other words, uh, you, you, uh, the doors cannot be physically shut while consultations are going on. And meetings between students and lecturers cannot be held outside of faculty premises. You know, and, and I think that this is also important. It's strict, but I, but, but I think it's important. Meetings elsewhere you know, would raise a presumption of wrongdoing. I mean, if, 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 if a meeting is, uh, if someone says, I was just going to have a, a meeting to discuss uh, a dissertation or to discuss a term paper with a student and I picked uh, a hotel as a conducive environment for that, that would obviously raise a presumption of wrongdoing. So I think that uh, the clarity that attends uh, these sorts of conduct and the ethical rules that must be abided by will uh, greatly help in creating uh, a much safer environment for, for uh, female students. The other conceptual problem with offenses of this nature is where fault might be located. You know, uh, there, there's always sometimes the uh, point that is made that victims might have brought the offense upon themselves by their attitude, by their dress, or their, by their willingness to be in a compromising place uh, with, a, with a lecturer. And this is one, uh, this is one um, notion that must be rejected and must be resisted. The victim must always be seen as the victim. There cannot be an excuse, especially given the power configuration between students and lecturers that the victim could have somehow invited the abuse upon themselves. I think it, 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 it is an important, uh, it is an important uh, consideration to be made and we must not allow uh, that, that, that notion to be allowed to, to persist. There's also the comparison sometimes made between demanding bribes you know, for service and sex for grace. And, and you know, sometimes uh, people would argue that uh, a bribe is a bribe, and there's no reason why the punishment for uh, sex as the currency of the bribe, wh why that should be stricter or more stringent than an ordinary bribe. I think that uh, the two are vastly different, uh, and they have vastly different impacts on the victim. Loss of cash in the payment well, of a bribe is uh, vastly different, in my view, from the physical violation 
and the lingering shame and guilt and other psychological effects uh, that the violation uh, would visit on the victim of, of such a violation, especially a young person, especially a young uh, person, a young girl. I think uh, the psychological effects are long running and uh, the Deputy Senate President had also made the point about uh, the lingering uh, psychological effects and, the, and this sort of devastation may never heal. So, I, so, so clearly, uh, offenders uh, should be visited with the, with the strictest possible consequences. Let me say in conclusion that uh, we must stay engaged on these issues. Governments, you know, civil society, and you know, we're extremely proud of the work uh, that uh, the Deputy Senate President has done on, uh, on the bill and the very yeah, determined way in which he has continued to pursue it. I think that we must all become uh, champions of uh, creating safe environments for females in our universities. The easier it is to report cases, the easier it is to be heard with empathy, with assurance of redress in appropriate cases, the faster the eradication or at least reduction of this uh, reprehensible phenomenon will be. I'd like to again thank you very much and to express again my sincere gratitude to the uh, to the Vice Chancellor and um, the staff of the um, Obafemi Awolo University, and to say that uh, your university is uh, clearly the best, second only to the University of Lagos. Thank you very much.